some way or the plant or animal has to cause harm in some way. So this can be harm to the environment. This can be something that causes us to lose money um, or it can be actual harm to our health as well. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, everything that we classify as terrestrial will mean stuff that's on land. Um, and everything that we classify as aquatic would be not only the water, but also the shoreline and the wetlands. Next slide. All right, so why we care about invasive species. Um, so I get a lot of questions about why we actually do any management and why we just kind of don't let nature take its course. Um, so it really goes back to that definition of being invasive and that for something to be defined is that, that it's having some sort of negative impact and that's gonna be on our protected cultural resources. It could be on endangered species or it could just be on native species to Minnesota. So a lot of times invasive species, they'll outcompete native species or they'll do things like interrupt the food web um, and affect the survival of a lot of keystone species like walleye, lake trout, they could affect cedar, birch, all those things that we really need to keep our environment intact. Um, so since this is the Gideon pro program, I'm gonna try to focus a lot on agricultural impacts and gardening impacts. Um, so invasive species have a lot of potential to negatively impact agricultural production. Um, so this is anything from hosting diseases that wouldn't be here otherwise without them here. Um, oftentimes they'll be in fields and they'll compete desired production products. Like if you're trying to grow soybeans and then you lose half your field to invasive species, that's causing a lot of economic harm as well as production harm, as well as environmental harm. Um, then they can actually cause harm to us as the farmers and caretakers of the land and they can cause harm to any animals that we have there as well. Um, so it causes harm to our in their window. Oh, no. sorry. <laughs> so in terms of uh, causing impacts to human health, we can have chemical reactions from invasive species. They can burn us, they can irritate our skin, they can give us allergies, they can make us sick, um, any of those things. In a few severe cases, they can actually cause death. Um, so it's always important to actually know what species you're dealing with. Um, and then being in Minnesota, a lot of us like to use the environment around us for recreational purposes and invasive species a lot of times can impede our use of waterways, hiking trails, parks, all those types of things. All right, next slide. So just a little bit of background about our program. Um, we're a little bit different with how we manage invasive species. And we really take that um, definition seriously. So just because something is listed as invasive, we actually monitor every single population of every single species to see if it's actually causing harm. And then our goal is not necessarily eradication, but just reducing it to non-harmful levels. So for some species that are really um, a threat to wild rice or a threat to cedar, or are causing injury to people, those ones you would likely have the goal of getting off of the reservation. But for invasive species that we can utilize, invasive species that are kind of not doing anything, those we'll typically leave alone and just monitor um, to make sure that they're not turning into a problem for the environment or for us. We also encourage uh, the safe use of invasive species as a form of control, <laughs> um, but again, I just wanna say, since there are some that can have severe detrimental impacts, um, if you're ever unsure of how to transport or use, uh, leave it alone until you ask for some advice or contact somebody before utilizing it, um, just because we want you to be safe out there while you're doing that. Next slide. All right, so pathways of spread. <laughs> so this is a lot of what we're gonna focus on tonight which is just different ways that invasive species can actually get around and move around um, and kind of some things we can do to interject to prevent that a little bit, as well as some examples of invasive species that have come here through these different avenues. So if you wanna click once, that would be great. <laughs> I did a lot of pop-ups for some reason, I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, so one of the first ways that stuff gets here is through aquaculture, aquaponics. So using like farming of fish and animals that big goldfish that you see that guy holding, um, that was actually taken from the Mississippi River. And it was thought to escape from somebody's water garden that they had where they had koi and goldfish in there and it got out. It actually escaped to this like back part of the river and it was just hanging out there for years until eventually this guy caught it. You see how big it got in that time frame. 
they're not meant to sustain things like that in those river systems. So the more that we add in there, the more of a problem it becomes. So kind of a cool photo, but not what we want to see every day in the Mississippi River. All right, can hit next. All right, purposely introduced for decoration or sport. Um, this is a huge one that a lot of invasive species are introduced through. So we'll be talking about this a little bit more extensively later tonight, um, but a lot of invasive species get here because somebody sees something, they think it looks pretty and they wanna bring it to their lawn, not knowing the consequences of those actions. So there's quite a few invasive species that get uh, transported that way. Next. So contaminated soil or seed. Uh, this is another big one, especially for this class for the Giddy Gun program. Um, we're gonna talk about this again a little bit more later, but there's quite a few agricultural invasive species that have been brought in um, from people getting things from unknown seed sources, um, or even if they do know if they haven't been uh, screened properly or uh, decontaminated properly, um, they're gonna be brought in that way. Next. Online sales is another big one. Um, it's really hard to regulate online sales um, and there's a lot of stuff available out there right now to do that. Next. So sales from large department stores, this kind of goes into that as well. Um, I do the same thing where I get really tempted to go buy that pretty flower I see hanging at Home Depot, <laughs> um, but we don't always know what that flower is supposed to be. So always just kind of being aware of those large department store sales. That's a huge one, especially um, in the summer months and when people have been quarantined with COVID, doing different things with plants has really taken off. Um, and just kind of getting whatever is available has kind of become the norm. Um, so we just want to make sure we're watching that. Next. And we actually have a question, Kelsey. Oh, yeah. um, Tammy's wondering if you have any recommendations um, to screen, oh, for screened and safe soil in bulk. Yeah, um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about soil later, but the Cliff Notes answer is, um, that you wanna look for stuff in the soil. So if you're purchasing big bulk soil and it's not um, from a certified source, or even if it is, make sure that you dig through it a little bit if possible. So typically invasive species um, with soil that have contaminations, it's gonna look a little bit different. So if you're used to that like really nice soil, um, if you have like earthworms in it, like we're gonna talk about in a little bit, it's gonna kind of look like coffee grounds and it's gonna look chunky. It's gonna look different than your soil should look. Um, so that's one of the big things to look for in soil. Um, and then the other thing would be, if you notice any plant parts off the bat, you can bet that that is not um, decontaminated soil. So that would be a big red flag as well. So hopefully that helps and we'll talk a little bit more about that too. But yeah, good question. <laughs> Um, so another way that things are introduced um, is unintentionally through contaminated equipment. This is especially true if you're doing big construction um, plots. If you're starting new gardening and you're borrowing equipment from somebody to create a plot, you just always want to make sure your equipment is decontaminated before doing that. Next. All right, so this is the really fun one that we see down here. <laughs> so escape to release plants or animals. So you might notice these police officers holding some crocodiles. That was actually from Brainerd, Minnesota, I think in 2014. And somebody had uh, crocodiles as pets and a gentleman on a bike path was going down and happened to see these two crocodiles that were released. <laughs> and had they not have been found, there's a possibility that we could have ended up with a population of crocodiles in Brainerd, Minnesota, had they survived the winter. So it's always a best practice to never release your plants or animals into the wild, either try to rehome them um, or contact an invasive species person to help you figure out what to do with those. Next. Um, so this is going more to the aquatic side, but I just thought it was important to mention um, if you're going fishing, um, it's always important to discard your bait properly. So there's invasive species laws against actually um, transporting any water from any source so you don't move um, potential invasive planktons around. Um, and so you don't use zebra mussels, um, those sorts of things. So we always wanna make sure that we're dumping out our water um, on the grass before and transporting with clean water if you're moving bait. 
um, to never uh, dump earthworms on the ground and to never release minnows or crayfish if you're using those for bait. Next. All right, and the last one that we'll talk about um, is ballast water from ocean going vessels. So if you're unfamiliar with what ballast water is, it's those huge ships that come to Duluth um, when they're bringing big cargo loads. They sometimes need to balance out the weight of the cargo um, with adding water. And up until about 2006, I believe, um, there was actually no regulations on where that water came from. So they were coming all the way from Europe sometimes with fresh water from Europe, all the way to Duluth Harbor, dumping out whenever they dropped off their cargo. And that's how we got a large majority of invasive species in the Duluth area on the aquatic side. So we got zebra mussels, spiny water fleet gobies, all those things from the ballast water that was going on check. Luckily that's been changed since then. They have to do what's called a swish and spit um, where they spit out their fresh water before they enter the St. Lawrence Seaway, collect all the salt water to do a rinse with that instead. And then when they get here, they release the salt water. Things can't survive um, in salt water and fresh water. So that's kind of how they clean it out. What we're targeting now with that is trying to figure out how to do decontaminating between all of the Great Lakes because there is currently not a lot of regulation that goes on from like Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, all the way to Lake Superior. So still a problem, but making some improvements. All right, next. Oh, sorry, one more, I guess. <laughs> All right, and natural events um, definitely can move invasive species around as well, although it's much more common for invasive species to spread um, through people than it is through the natural events such as flooding and wind. Um, however, in that really big flood of 2012, there was definitely some invasive species transport going on around Duluth with that. Next. All right, so now we're going to talk about a few specific introductions um, based on those pathways. So the first one is introduction for decoration um, is buckthorn. So you might've heard of common or European buckthorn, maybe even glossy buckthorn. Those are all around Minnesota. Um, it's very widely distributed at this point. It was introduced in the late 1800s for privacy. People liked how gnarly it grew and it gave them a natural offense from their neighbors, but it's all over Minnesota now. And unfortunately for us, it really affects soybeans and it also affects um, oats and barley because it's an overwintering host for an aphid, which is really um, negative to soybeans. And then that crown rust fungus as well um, can really take out oat and barley fields. So unfortunately, we didn't have the buckthorn. We wouldn't have those damages to those important crops. But since we do, um, it's really difficult to get rid of those diseases in terms of woodlands takes over woodland area completely is in the understories. Um, it makes it totally impassable for us, for animals, makes forest regeneration really difficult, makes harvesting anything out of the woods really difficult. And then for recreation as well, it's just really hard to get around because of how much it takes over the understory. So depending on what you're looking for, um, it does have a medicinal purpose or purpose as a diuretic, which can be really good if that's what you're after, but can be really bad if that's what you're not. <laughs> um, so the berries in buckthorn, um, they have been used to kind of help flush out your digestive system. However, a lot of times in really harsh winters, um, this is a problem for animals because they it's one of the last things to lose its berries. So when it's the only thing that's left to eat, animals are forced to eat it then it causes that extra dehydration um, through having to eat those diuretic berries. So again, if you're harvesting stuff in the woods, they do have some lookalikes that are native. They're kind of a purple berry. You wanna make sure that you're eating the native one that you're after and not this buckthorn that's a diuretic or you might have a really crappy afternoon, <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> um, and they're also used for dye and woodworking. Um, so that really Really a beautiful purple berry. Some people will use it for a dye um, and it can be used for any sort of dyeing material. And then they have a really cool um, orange bark that's really hard. So a lot of people will actually use that to like make um, bowls or decorative pieces out of. Next. All right, so this is how we kind of identify buckthorn. Um, the biggest thing I want you to look at is the picture of my hand up there. So the reason it's called buckthorn is you can see those buds kind of look like deer hooves. So that's what gives it buck um, or the name buck. They almost line up oppositely, but not quite. And then at the very end of the branch there, they have a thorn that comes out of the middle. 
So think of it as a thorn in the middle of a buck hoof, and that's how you can identify buckthorn. Um, also, if you just peel a little bit of the bark away, it's always going to have that really bright orange color, um, and that's something that's really unique to buckthorn as well. Um, so if you're going to utilize it, it is illegal to transfer any of the noxious weeds that we're talking about according to Minnesota law. However, you can get a permit and I can help you get that. Um, or you can look on the MBA's website if you're going to do it. But to transport buckthorn safely, its berries are how it reproduces. So you can just put berries in a Ziploc bag or enclosed bag, bring them to where you want them to be, um, and then just make sure when you're done with them that you're bringing them to a proper disposal site. It's best if you can just do a lot of what you want to do on the site so you're not bringing invasive species anywhere else. All right, next. All right, so here's where we talk a little bit more about soils. Um, so the biggest issue with soils right now in Minnesota are that they're transporting earthworms. And we have this new special type of earthworm called a jumping worm um, that's a little bit different, much more aggressive and causing a lot more issues. So the difference between a jumping worm and kind of the European earthworm that you're used to seeing is that it's really smooth throughout its entire body. Um, if you feel it, it's not gonna have those ridges like the normal earthworm would, kind of almost has like a hard casing on it. And then it moves like a snake. So it's gonna kind of do that S wriggle. And sometimes it'll even jump, which is kind of like a twitch out of the dirt. Um, so when you're looking at your dirt, especially in those bulk scenarios, try to look for worms. But if you can't look for worms, look what the dirt looks like. And if it looks like coffee grounds, it's looking really chewed up. Um, if it doesn't look like it's been you know, properly taken care of, like that would be big flags that you would wanna have it more closely screened. And then I would ask where it came from, if the area came from is known to have jumping worms or earthworms in it. Um, right now, jumping worms are only in the metro area. Um, and there's been extensive studies throughout the state looking for them. So not 100% that it hasn't moved from there, but pretty solid at this point that it's only in the metro. Um, so just make sure when you're buying dirt, that you know the source that it's coming from. Uh, jumping worms, if they do get into your soil, they can actually change the soil chemistry um, more so than the European earthworms do. And they'll kill your current plants um, and they'll for sure give you a hard time growing new plants in your garden. So really bad to have these around. They also aid in uh, destroying the ecosystem similar to other earthworms where they eat that leaf litter really fast um, to a point where the nutrients can't be used by the forest how they normally would be, and then they get leached, and then the forest doesn't actually have enough nutrients to keep itself protected um, and thriving for the rest of the time that it's meant to. So not only does it have impacts to your garden, having really detrimental effects to those uh, forests as well. So again, just make sure that you're looking. Okay, oh, I thought we had a question. I'm gonna look at that really quick. Yes. Yep, so worms in your composting systems. That's a super great question. So yes, you are supposed to have worms in your composting system. You definitely don't want them to be jumping worms. <laughs> if you're going to use them, you want them to be those European earthworms. And you wanna make sure that you're using them at the right levels, like not dumping a whole bunch in there. But it is definitely a fine balance between having worms for composting, releasing them into forested areas where you don't want them. Um, and using the right type of worm. So that's a great question. If you have, if you want me to explain further about that, I can. Um, but from an invasive species standpoint, worms are bad. From composting, worms are good. <laughs> so you have to kind of meet in the middle um, and use those European earthworms and use them at a um, appropriate level. Does that make sense? Hopefully. All right. <laughs> um, and then clean off any tools and equipment before you move to other other areas. All right, go ahead to the next slide. All right, so Palmer amaranth. I'm not sure if anybody has heard about um, this one so far, but this was actually introduced into Minnesota um, through agricultural seed mixes from uh, Iowa. So these seed mixes were screened, but these seeds are super, super tiny. Um, so they were still able to make it through the screening initially. So now what we do is uh, genetic testing to see if there's any um, DNA found in those seed mixes before they come up 
um, and that's been able to kind of control this as well. So right now they're mostly found in southern Minnesota and we're trying to prevent it from moving up here. But again, really important to check your seed sources to make sure that you know what you're getting. Um, so typically they're gonna be roughly six to eight feet, maybe taller. They don't have any hairs on the stem. It's really difficult to identify them without the flower. They kind of look like a bunch of other pigweeds in Minnesota. Um, but once they get to kind of this, that bottom point down there where they're all over the field, they're really tall, it's pretty easy to detect that as well. Um, so the best way to do, um, manage Palmer amaranth is to find it early and then hopefully you'll be able to mow it, weed whip it or clip it down. All right, next. So online sales, <laughs> this is such a tricky one to tackle because um, I know especially in today's day and age, everybody wants to do the online sale because it's convenient and it's easy, um, but this is almost impossible to regulate from an invasive species standpoint. So there's lots of um, websites that may have disclaimers like check your own state, this is illegal and such and such, but it doesn't actually prevent you from buying it, um, which is really, really difficult. So it's up to us to kind of do our own research and make sure that whatever we're purchasing is actually um, not an invasive species and is something that's good for the environment. I encourage people to, instead of researching, is this plant invasive, should I buy it? To be, is this plant native, should I buy it? Always look for good native species versus looking if something's invasive. Most invasive species were brought here without knowing the effects that they were gonna have and turned into huge problems later. So it's always good to start native if possible and then move out from there. Um, if you're uncertain about something, you can always reach out to people, local experts. I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I will try to do research for you <laughs> um, so we can determine if something is safe to buy or not. All right, next. Um, so large store sales. So this goes back to um, also kind of that issue with the online stuff. Even though that there is regulations in Minnesota prohibiting um, the sale of certain different plants and certain different animals, um, it doesn't always get caught, especially in those big department stores. So one example of this is at Pier 1 in Duluth when it was here, there was a Phragmites rooster. So Phragmites is an invasive grass. And if we have time, I'll show you a little bit about how to identify that later. Um, but it's in the St. Louis River estuary right now. And it's in a few places around Minnesota, um, but what it does is kind of overtake wetland and riparian areas. It grows to about 10 feet tall and it's a huge fire hazard. So Wisconsin right now has Phragmites all along the Lake Michigan uh, coast and they have to spend literally millions of dollars on fire suppression every year because these light up and they're basically like little matches and it um, really is dangerous to all of their coastal towns. And then in addition, for us, we're worried about it because it could overtake wild rice habitat, kind of grows in those wetland uh, places where you lose diversity with birds, um, fishes, all those sorts of things. So we're concerned about it. Um, but there is a rooster made of Phragmites seed heads that was being sold at Pier 1 in Duluth. Um, and it, we have no idea how long it was being sold there, how many people bought it. But when somebody finally noticed it, then we were able to get it off the shelf, at least, at least in Minnesota, but who knows how many places that actually went out to. So this happened in Duluth at a store here and in place that we're actively spending money to try to manage this invasive species. <laughs> the other one that you might've heard of really recently um, is that at Petco, there has been these moss balls that have come in and they're covered in zebra mussels. So they were shipped in from Ukraine and in Ukraine, zebra mussels are actually native. Nobody checked them before they got over here. And now all of a sudden there has been tons of moss balls with zebra mussels going out into people's aquariums. If they stay in the aquariums, this will be fine. Odds are at least a few of those people will release their aquarium water somewhere into the wilderness at some point, And we'll have a whole bunch of new infestations of zebra mussels. So even though zebra mussels are actually federally regulated, and forbidden from sale in the entire US, they would still manage to make it into Petco and um, cause this big issue. So always just kind of be aware of what you're buying. Um, so even though there's laws, 
always try to double check yourself um, that what you're getting is what they say is what you're getting. Um, and if you're looking for invasive species like this um, moss pellet petco, just look at it, see if there's something on there that you don't recognize and don't be afraid to ask about it. That's really the best way to look for invasives is look for things that look like they don't belong um, and then ask about it, ask and see if that's something that's supposed to be there. All right, next. So pollinator kits, um, Erica kind of recommended this to me to talk about a little bit that could be relevant to this class. Um, so if you're purchasing them from outside areas, I think again, this just kind of goes back to um, the large store purchases and the online purchases that you always wanna check every single seed that they say that they're including if it's native to the area versus if it's invasive. That's just the best way to make sure whatever you're putting down is going to be something that's beneficial to Minnesota and specifically to Northern Minnesota. Um, if it's possible for you to source locally, that's awesome. Um, whether it's somebody you know in the area um, and that you trust to make sure that they're not actually getting stuff from somewhere else. <laughs> um, or if it's one of these local stores. Um, so just an example I put up here was when we did a big pollinator reseeding um, for the solar site. I went to Prairie Restoration. This was kind of the list they gave me. So we went through all of these different grasses and wildflower mixes to make sure that they were actually good for pollinators in Minnesota and this area. And the reason I like them is because they also collect their seeds sustainably from Minnesota. So anytime that you can find resources that are local versus going online or to outside areas, for one, you know that the seed is going to do this um, or do what you want to. It's going to grow in this area. And for two, you can be pretty confident um, that what you're getting is made in mixes. So it looks like we have another question. Um, so it's about aquarium water. If people dump aquarium water down the drain, uh, zebra mussels spread that way too, right? Yes, absolutely, Cynthia. <laughs> um, yeah, so if people are dumping stuff into their septic, that's another great way for stuff to spread in Duluth. If you actually look at the outflow from the city into Lake Superior, it is covered in zebra mussels. Part of that is from people dumping stuff down the drain. Part of it is just because there's zebra mussels in the estuary. But yes, if you're dumping stuff, you know, it doesn't always get filtered out the way that it should. Um, so yeah, definitely that's a, a risk. All right, next. All right, so contaminated equipment was another pathway that we had. Um, and just on the reservation, this is something that we're dealing with at a really large level. Um, so wild parsnip, uh, this is a plant that will cause phytochemical burns. And I apologize, I thought I put a picture up here of my arm that got burned a couple years ago, but I must have forgotten to put it on here. Um, but it causes blisters and burns if you're exposed to the sap of the plant. So if you just touch a leaf or a flower, as long as you didn't break any part of it, and there's no sap that got on you, you'll be fine. Um, where it comes from is, let's say, you're walking and you bend the um, stem of a twig over and then you're exposed to all of that sap. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, you bend the leaf over that sap. Um, that's how you're gonna actually get that on your skin. As soon as it's exposed to sunlight, um, then you're also going to have those reaction burns. So this plant was brought in by construction equipment in the first year on that top picture, it stays in rosette form. And that second year, it's gonna be those bolting big yellow flowers and it grows anywhere from six to 10 feet high. We have about 60 monoculture acres of this on the reservation from contaminated construction equipment alone. So this year as construction equipment is coming through, we are making sure that we're decontaminating all that equipment before it comes on the reservation. Um, but in your own gardens, you may not see it, but just know that it's around, especially if you're in this area. Um, so make sure you're cleaning your equipment before you move it anywhere else. This one especially loves disturbed soil. So if you're making a garden plot and you bring in a shovel from somebody else's garden that you don't know about, um, this could easily come in and invade your garden and take over within a year or two. If you look at that huge flower head that's on there, that's from one plant. 
And that is thousands of seeds that are gonna be dispersed by the wind if you don't take care of it. And now imagine that you have a solid acre of that. Um, pretty soon it's gonna get out of control. So this is one that you really want to stay on top of. And it's one that you wanna make sure you're cleaning your equipment so you don't bring it other places. So if you harvest this one safely, its roots can actually be used for food. Um, so that's one of the ways that we actually utilize parsnip on reservation. Um, so you harvest it in its first year rosette stage before it bolts up into those big flowers. But if you do that, make sure you're wearing gloves, make sure you're wearing long sleeves, wash no matter what immediately afterwards with soap and water. And if you suspect that you got sap on your skin, stop what you're doing, have a water bottle on hand and rinse it off um, as well as you can. And that should mitigate all the effects of the sap. What you don't wanna do is what I did. <laughs> Or you get sap on your skin, you know you got it on your skin, you don't have any water, you don't stop what you're doing and you're like, eh, it'll be fine. It won't be fine. You'll get blisters, you'll get scars. <laughs> so just take care of it immediately. <laughs> All right, go ahead to the next one. Oh, there it is. <laughs> I don't know why that popped up later, but okay. Um, so escaped plants and animals, this is another one, another pathway that we were talking about. So just whenever you're planting something, know how you're going to contain it to make sure that it doesn't, um, doesn't get out to places that you unintended to. So the Asiatic carp species, those are three different types of carp. That's the big head, the grass, and the silver carp. Um, they were all brought over to the U.S. Uh, to be used in aquaculture. And they escaped into the Mississippi River and now are some of the worst invaders that we have around the US. Um, we're really concerned about them getting into the Great Lakes, partly because of their size and the, um, how quickly they reproduce and the devastation that that have to the ecosystem that's there. These fish can get anywhere from 60 pounds for the big head or for the grass and silver carp. And the big head carp can actually get up to 120 pounds. Oh, excuse me, I keep running out of breath. <laughs> um, but the big head carp and the silver carp, or excuse me, just the silver carp can jump about 10 feet out of the air. They can actually hit people in the head and they've been known to kill people by knocking them unconscious and then they drown in the water. So in addition to these being entirely environmentally destructive, they also are a huge hazard to human health. They're usually present in these huge populations in riverways, and anytime that you have noise and boat through there, that's gonna scare them, they're gonna jump up and you're gonna have that um, possibility of being hit in the head and having um, being knocked unconscious. Um, so we wanna keep these out of the Great Lakes. Uh, one way that we can do that is people actually will go bow hunting for them, they'll go fishing for them, they'll try to scare them and collect them in their boat. They're actually a really tasty fish. Most people don't wanna eat them because there's always kind of a, Ickiness that is associated with carp species, um, but these ones taste really good, especially if you just put them in the smoker. All right, next. All right, so identifying and reporting invasive species. So this is probably um, one of the biggest things that you can do to help prevent the spread, to also learn how to manage stuff, um, we're gonna, we went through a couple of invasive species, we might go through a few more, but if you're looking for extra identification guides, you can, you can find them on the Fond du Lac website, you can find them on MBA's website, DNR, NITFIN is the Midwest Invasive Plant Network, um, and Minnesota Sea Grants website. You can also download iNaturalist, um, which is an app that can tell you um, how, what you have, but just use it with a grain of salt um, because it's not always 100% accurate. If you suspect you have invasive species, if it's on the reservation, I would appreciate if you report it to me. Um, if it's off the reservation and ceded territories, you can report it to me or you can report it to other local officials. There's a couple of programs also that you can become involved in that give you a little bit more training. Um, you can be a forest pest first detector, which is through the University of Minnesota, as is the Aquatic Invasive Species First Detector. And this just gives you some training. It's totally free on how to identify different invasive species in your area. All right, next. So managing um, in your garden, just at a very basic level, 
I'd say that hand pulling is probably the most effective means of control for most species, um, especially if you have small populations of it. So again, just be careful um, with unknown species, just to make sure it's not one of the dangerous ones that's going to cause you a lot of harm. Um, but otherwise, hand pulling um, can be really effective for small populations. If you have a larger area that you're trying to prep or that is just really infested with stuff, um, in this top picture, you can see all those yellow flowers and white flowers. So that is all invasive species. It's a mix of tansy, parsnip, um, and queen anne's lace, which is a type of carrot. So you had to mow that, or mow that area continuously. And then in the bottom is what it looked like after three times mowing that season. So it's mostly grass, but it would be ready to um, reseed hopefully in the next year and have some good natives popping back up in it. And again, um, if you're going to use invasive species, especially if it's a small population and you're hand pulling it, um, just make sure that you're using and discarding properly. All right, go ahead to the next one. So monitoring invasive species, um, this naturally follows management. Um, so if you're gonna do any management of invasive species in your garden, that's awesome. Um, but just make sure that you're able to monitor your success of um, how much control is taking place as well. So before you start management, take note of the number or acres or square feet that you have of invasive species as well as what you have. And then each year see if your population is growing, decreasing or staying the same. So depending on what invasive species you have, maybe you want it to stay the same. Um, maybe you want it to go away completely. Um, but this is how you can judge whatever you're doing if it's being effective or not. Um, so one of the questions I get the most is about buckthorn um, and people are always like well I just keep cutting my buckthorn and it never goes anywhere. Um, so buckthorn is actually kind of like that um, monster in Greek mythology where if you cut one head off three more grow back. <laughs> so if you just cut buckthorn you're actually causing it to sprout without any other form of control. So the best way to manage buckthorn is by pulling it out of the root system and not actually just cutting it. And then you need to hang the roots in a tree somewhere because if you just leave them on the ground, it'll actually replant and start regrowing as well. So buckthorn is a little bit different than a lot of plants. Um, another reason that your populations could be sprouting, even if you're like mowing or pruning, is that it's happening at the wrong type of year. So if you don't mow before it goes to seed, mowing your plants will actually cause them to spread more. So if you're going to do the mowing method, you've got to get out there before it actually seeds and then you have to keep going. So I just saw a question from Tammy, can you burn it? Yes, you can burn it, absolutely. So with buckthorn, you just have to make sure the flame gets really hot. Um, so sometimes people will burn it and it won't be hot enough to get all the way down to the roots. Um, but if you have enough material there, you can for sure burn it and it'll be really successful. So, yep. Um, and then again, just monitoring, it's a great way to keep invasives from spreading out of control. All right, go ahead to the next one. And I actually had a question. When you're weeding, um, can you compost those weeds if it's those that small amount? Yeah. Of yep. So the biggest thing with composting um, is that you want to make sure it's in the middle of other material. So you don't want it to be on the edges, <laughs> if at all possible because that's where it's gonna have a chance to spread. You don't want it to be on top because then you could have wind dispersal of those seeds as it's composting. So as long as you can mix it into other things or put a tarp on top of it until it's kind of you know, decayed a little bit, totally safe to compost. Yep. All right, next slide. So decontaminating equipment. We already talked about this a little bit, um, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it but it is best to decontaminate where you are always. So if you have the option, try to do your decontamination wherever you're doing the work. Um, the reason for that is if you bring it home, then you brought all those invasive species from where you were at to now your home. And then if you're clearing it off at home, you could actually start a little invasive species garden, which you probably don't want, <laughs> um, just by washing off all those seeds there. So um, try to physically clear off any debris you see not everybody can bring water with them um, in the field and not all areas. Um, we want you to use water in any way. If you're in a wetland, you, we don't want you to use water. Um, so just bring a brush, try to get off all dirt and debris as best you can. 
And then if you have to bring it somewhere, make sure that's on a concrete slab and not somewhere where those invasive species are gonna reroot. All right, next. So proper transport and disposal of invasive species. We've already talked about this a little bit as well, so I won't spend a ton of time. Um, but if you're mowing big things, make sure that you don't bring your contaminated mower somewhere else without decontaminating it in between. Um, and then making sure that you're mowing consistently for effective control. If you're pruning, this kind of depends on the time of year. So if you are pruning and your seed heads are not mature yet and they haven't gone to seed, you can actually just drop them where they are and they'll be totally fine. They'll compost eventually and they'll be all good. However, if your seed heads are close to mature or totally mature, you need to put them in garbage bags and bring them to an approved waste disposal site, um, such as WLSS and there's one on the reservation as well. Um, but if you just drop a fully uh, full seed head onto the ground, all you're going to do is put all those seeds back in there. And all the effort you did in pruning is going to probably be multiplied by a whole lot. <laughs> um, so disposing of unused parts. Um, so composting, like we just talked about, just make sure that you have it arranged in a way where no plant parts are going to escape via wind or planting into the ground. Um, you can also lay out a tarp and just dry your plants on the sun, um, or you can put in tied bags and transport to a waste disposal site. And if you have any questions, you can always ask again. All right, next slide. All right, so utilizing different invasive species. Um, so I'm going to go through just a couple of invasive species and how you can use them. Um, and then we'll probably take a break for questions because I know this is getting kind of long. <laughs> um, so in the picture here is a buckthorn bull. The only thing I'll say again is just always ask and make sure you know what you're utilizing. Um, some of these actually require consulting with the doctor depending on um, what you're using it for. All right, next. All right, so garlic mustard, um, this is a really nice one. This one spreads everywhere really, really quickly. It takes over forest floors. So if you have this, you wanna keep it in a small population. Luckily, it is super tasty. So you can use long leaves, uh, small seeds and flowers. You can cook them um, or have them raw and you can use them in dishes and salads. Um, they've also been used for medicine in terms of using the stems for asthma or you can put the leaves on sting bites and use it as an antiseptic. Um, so this one, if you have it and you wanna keep a small patch, great, um, but just make sure that you're staying on top of it every year and it's not um, spreading at all. So that goes back to that monitoring um, because once it escapes, it escapes very quickly and it escapes very fast and then it gets really hard to control. Um, so in small populations, you can just hand pull it. There's probably enough seed bank there for it to come back year after year after year. Um, in larger amounts, and you're probably going to have to mow or weed with it. All right, next. All right, common tansy. Um, so this is one that you have probably seen everywhere. Um, this is everywhere up in northern Minnesota. It has those cool little button flowers, um, and it outcompetes native vegetation. However, this one is toxic to livestock and people if consumed in large amounts. In small amounts, it's fine, but if you eat it in large amounts or if plant animals eat it in large amounts, it can actually lead to death. So you have to be really careful with how much of this you're using. So this plant also has abortative properties um, and it can be used in teas and oils um, for things such as parasite infections, migraine pain, epilepsy seizures, joint pain. So there's a lot of good things about it. Um, but you just have to make sure that you're using it for what you want it to use it for. If you're pregnant, don't even walk through a field of tansy. It's just not worth the risk. Um, an easy thing that you can do with this one though is use as an insect repellent. So a lot of times what my crew will do in the summer is we have an enclosed bag, right? Because we don't want to spread any of that seed, but just have a burlap sap so that it fumigates out. You can clip a little bit of those tansy flowers, put them in your bag, and then you have a natural insect repellent without having to do anything else throughout the day. Great, right, next. All right, and someone was wondering if goats can eat tansy, right, Tammy? Yeah, yep, so in small amounts, Tammy. So this is one where we're not sure the actual threshold, um, but when we had goats for grazing buckthorn, we actually saw them eating the tansy and they were totally fine. 
but I would say it was about um, maybe like 50 to 100 tans tansy stems total, so not huge amounts of it. So it's fine again if it's in smaller amounts, just as long as that's like not the only thing that they're eating. Good question. And then someone was also just wondering what garlic mustard looks like. Is there a- Yeah, I'm so sorry. I must have sent you like a wrong PowerPoint because there were photos that I had on there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so how about I, uh, for Sue, can I send out photos after the presentation? And I can actually include a link as well to the Fond du Lac website for identification. Yeah, um, well, that works. Sorry, Sue, I apologize. I don't know what happened to those. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we can go to the next one. I think we're almost through these, I hope. <laughs> All right, so Japanese knotweed. Um, this is one that colonizes rapidly around riverways and riparian areas, um, and it can tolerate a whole bunch of different growing conditions, and it's really, really hard to get rid of. So it's really cool um, in its native area is Hawaii and it's actually breaks through volcanic rock. It's the first plant to come up. So it is absolutely meant to get through um, really, really hard surfaces, which is cool in Hawaii. It's not cool when it's happening to the foundation of your house. So this one you wanna watch because um, it will actually break through houses and cause your property value to go down. Um, in England, if you have this on your property, you are legally obligated to get rid of it before you can sell your house. Um, and it's really difficult to get rid of. So for us, we like to keep it at these small population levels um, or get rid of it completely. But you can use it for tinctures in the root system um, and also the small parts of the plant when they're just sprouting out. They can be used similar to rhubarb. Um, so they kind of have a similar taste. Um, you can also burn these patches, so we've done that. Again, we're trying to get it really, really hot so it goes all the way down into the root system. You can also do mowing, although there's a little bit of risk in that because these roots can extend really far out. Um, so if you think you're mowing the whole thing, all of a sudden you might have a little sprout pop up maybe 50 feet away that you don't realize and then you have a whole different population. So this one, it's best to either burn, graze, um, or use herbicide to get rid of if you're worried you can't control it. But if you can just keep it growing in this small little patch like that, it should be totally fine. All right, next. Yeah. Kelsey, someone was wondering, I can't, uh, is this the one that kind of looks like bamboo? Yes, <laughs> yes it is, yep. <laughs> Absolutely, yep. All right, and I'm gonna stop after this one because I just want there to be more time for questions unless you guys want me to keep going. Sorry, I'm long-winded, <laughs> um, but spotted knapweed, is, okay. <laughs> um, spotted knapweed is another really good one, um, that, or not a good one, another one that's all over the reservation. Um, so you're gonna see this, especially in gravelly areas, um, and it really just kind of monopolizes areas that it's in, um, and it outcompetes native vegetation. So the good news is it's not completely useful for pollinators as a lot of other plants are. However, it's also not as good of a source as native pollinators. So it's kind of like, they'll use it if it's there, but it's not preferred. Um, you can use this one in um, teas to help with jaundice, eye disorders and indigestion. Um, it can also be used for gingivitis and bruises, um, but this one has not as many good uses as negative effects. So. This is one that we also try to kind of just get rid of um, versus keeping in small populations. And I'm gonna stop there. Um, there is more to this presentation, which maybe I can send out in a PDF if people are interested, um, but I would love to just have any questions before we completely run out of time. So sorry for being long-winded. <laughs> Thank you for your time though. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelsey, for sharing all of your knowledge. This is great. And I know <laughs> You know, if there's, we see a lot of those out at the farms and I'm sure people are seeing them in, in their garden too. So thank you, Kelsey. Yeah, anyone, if you have questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask or ask in the chat. I have a question. Um, I just wanna um, confirm is, is that the, what other difference are between jumping worms and air worms? Yeah, um, so again, the biggest one is that so the European earthworm, it does eat like 
leaf litter and floor material, um, but it doesn't do it as fast as the jumping worm. So that's why the jumping worm is a little bit worse. But the biggest difference is that it's smooth. So when you feel the European earthworms and you look at them, you can kind of see the sections of the bodies. Um, but unfortunately with the, or not unfortunately, but with the um, earthworm jumping worm, it's gonna be really, really smooth. So you feel it and it's just gonna not have those like sections as defined. It's gonna almost have like a hard layer on the outside, if that makes sense. It's not gonna have those lumps. Yeah. Um, I have another question. Um, yeah. So, for example, last year people was getting package of seeds in the mail. Um, yeah. Just more about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm not really sure what was up with that. To be honest, I don't have a good answer for that. I know that if you got one, you're supposed to send it to the Minnesota Department of Agriculture to be analyzed. Um, so I would say if you do get like unknown packages of seeds, just send them to the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. You can just Google it and they sh it should be fairly easy to find where you're supposed to send them to. Um, but they came out with this statement not too long ago that also kind of said that they were baffled about why they were being sent. They didn't find harmful things in there. They found invasive things in there, so they don't want you to plant them. Um, but they're, they were also just really confused why those were being sent over here. Um, so if you ever, I mean, especially in that extreme example, that's a very unknown seed source, don't just plant it. <laughs> um, but if you're ever unsure of the seed source, just best advice to not plant that, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. All right. um, Tammy, it looks it's like you asked a question, do I come look at people's fields? Um, so we can. Um, I'm actually trying to get my invasive species specialist to kind of take that project over. So it's not fully set up yet, um, but I have three employees who I want to become kind of our hay and gravel pit inspectors, similar to kind of like what a county egg inspector would do. Um, so if you request it, we will try to make time to come out there and look at it with you. Although I can't um, totally guarantee this year that we'll have all the time to do that. Um, but that is in the works where we're trying to get that set up where we can come out and look at stuff for people. But if you're ever really concerned about something, you can also take a picture, send me GPS coordinates, um, do those sorts of things. And then if we have time or when we have time, we'll come out there and look at people's fields as well. So not fully set up yet, but we're trying to head in that direction. And I would always rather have more people reporting stuff to me than less. And we'll just figure out a time to make sure that we can work it in. <laughs> Let's see. Then Kelsey, one of our producers just direct messaged me wondering about if we see something like Canadian thistle, which people yep. Uh, some people like for medicine anyways. Yep. Um, should we still report it? What What do you think with things like that? Yeah, um, so I would say if you know that somebody um, wants to utilize that population to report it, but then let me know that somebody is utilizing it. Um, so typically like when we would find Canada thistle, we don't really manage it unless it's in direct areas impeding something else that's going on. Um, so if it's on like, a roadside or if it's um, in somebody's field, like we would probably leave it alone and just ask if they wanna keep an eye on it. If it's somewhere where it's an open disturbed area, like a big trail or big corridor or highly used place, that's a place where we would probably manage it. Um, so it kind of depends on the location, um, but yeah, you can report it and you can also put a note in there like would prefer to be left alone or just monitored. Um, so with a lot of our populations, we do do only monitoring versus actual just management right off the bat. But if, on the other hand, if you're like, hey, this thistle is impeding my mint harvest, which we had somebody report also, <laughs> um, then we'll go out and manage it right away or as soon as we can, as much time as we can dedicate to it. So if that can go both ways. Yeah, Kelsey, Okay, and then a couple more quick questions. I'm wondering if you work with uh, controlled burns. And then, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so we do do controlled burns. Um, this has kind of fallen by the wayside as other stuff has popped up. 
But yes, that has happened in the past and we plan to continue that in the future. Um, with all the construction projects going on, um, it's kind of had, and then COVID last year, it kind of fell by the wayside the last couple of years, um, but this is something we did two years ago and that we'll try to continue doing in the future for sure. Yeah. Okay, and then it is. Um, so if folks need to leave, feel free. Um, uh, Kelsey, looks like there are a couple of quick questions in the chat. So if you're able to answer them there, that'd be great. And then um, Erica, do you, do you want to talk about the class this Thursday, Thursday quickly? <laughs> Uh, yes, just to invite everyone, um, this coming Thursday, uh, we have the class with Dan Cornelius from sticks to uh, from planting sticks to tractors. Um, if you you are not part of the producer training program, please email me so I can send you the link. Uh, if you are part of the program, you already have the the Zoom link for this coming Thursday, uh, five thirty to six thirty. And everybody, everyone is welcome. Thank you, Erica. And then, yeah, feel free to come back um, this uh, week from today. Um, we'll have Jessica Greendeer um, from Juma Wealth Health talking about soil health. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and yeah, it's 6.30. So if people want to hang around and chat or ask Kelsey more questions, Kelsey, I'm not sure if you can stick around or if you need to take care yeah, of Yeah, I can stick around but, for a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> People yeah. still have questions. I know there's there's a lot of information and it's yeah. a lot of things we all deal with um, every season. So. I have one question. One yeah. more. Yeah. Um, is napweed and density bad for pollinators or 